Amen. Thank you, Gary. So open up your Bibles or click, switch, whatever you do, um, to Mark 16th chapter. So yes, we are in the last chapter of Mark. We are finishing today with the book of Mark. It's been, what, uh, I think 16 months or so in Mark, but uh, we're just about done today. So first Sunday of the year, and it's been a very interesting year, 2020. You know, it's over now, unless we are dealing with a very dysle dyslexic Mayan who wrote 2012, but meant 2021. We'll have to see this as the year envelops, develops. But anyway, this year, we're still the same people, the same need of a savior, in need of his grace and power every single day. So please open up the, the book to uh, Mark chapter 16, and let this word minister to us this morning, to encourage us and to challenge us as we draw near to Christ, our Lord and Savior. So let's read verses 1 through 7. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And, when, and they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He had reason. He has reason. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, from tre for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Amen. So we are here in the aftermath of the crucifixion. A few days have passed, and the disciples are still confused and scattered. The cry of Jesus on the cross, which was pretty much a quote from Psalms 22, right now can be easily repeated by these frightened followers of Jesus. Psalms 22 says this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I bet this is how disciples felt in those days. They felt forsaken and alone and obviously confused. They somehow forgot all the promise of Christ that he will come back. The psalm continues. Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. This is the aftermath of the cross. We're still Christ was invisible to disciples up until, up until to this moment. So what we have here in this first verse of Mark, of Mark 16, we have the women at the tomb. It's funny how, not funny, but interesting how uh, both uh, Luke and Mark insist on this presence of the women first that see Jesus, the resurrected one, bringing up this uh, presence of the ladies in, at the tomb, even before the, the disciples. Mary Magdalene, Mary and Salome, in their pain and their loss, they come to minister to the one last time to their loved master. Troubled by worry, they witness in amazement the miracle of the stone rolled away and the presence of an angel. Imagine that scene when they walk in, they, they walk, or walk there, they see the, the, the stone being removed, and they're amazed by encountering an angel. Or if you're reading John, actually two of them. And if, as you continue to read in John 20, as we'll read in a moment, actually the Lord himself spoke to them at the grave. Let's see this exact moment through the eyes of John the Evangelist. It's chapter 20 of John, verse 11 and on. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they had laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. But Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned away, she turned and she said to him in Aramaic, 
Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Imagine the beauty of that scene and the hope and the joy that this, this women had when they met the angels and when Jesus himself spoke to them. The angel was there, the Lord himself was there, and the message was clear. He has risen. This almost feels like an like a Easter message right now, but this is the, the core of, of the message here. The Christ, Christ the Lord has risen. I want to listen to this uh, old Christian chant from the Eastern Orthodox Church that is being sang at every single Easter, the main song that Christians in the East sing. In Greek, it would say, Christos anesti ek nekron, which means Christ has risen from the dead. But in English, is this, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs, bestowing life. Amazing, simple song, amazing, powerful, and I just, uh, I love to sing it at Easter uh, when, uh, when we celebrate the birth, I'm sorry, not the birth, but the risen of our Lord. And you see, this is because the core of our faith is not what happened at Christmas. The core of our faith is what happens after the cross, which is the resurrection of our Lord. Our strength today comes from the power of the cross and the power of his resurrection together. Why the power of the cross? Let's walk back, you know, to last, uh, last Sunday or last chapter. You know, we saw, we, saw, we saw there the limitless love of God. He stayed on the cross even though he had the power not to or had the choice not to, you know, he could have said no, but he still did it because he loved us. It was a loving choice of the Son of God to come and suffer and die for us, being silent because he knew that was the right thing to do. It was a necessity at the cross because of our sins. You know, in that tragedy, triumph was born. Just remember Colossians 2 verses 14 and 15, I think, that speak about the victory we achieved, our Christ achieved actually for us at the cross. It was that atoning sacrifice of the cross. Like John says in 1 John 2, 2, Christ is the propitiation for us. A fancy word, which means the sacrifice that removes the wrath of God from us. Christ at the cross removed the wrath of God from us. It comes from his love and aimed at removing the barrier of sin between us and God the Father. And by that, it brought peace with God. Like I said last Sunday, when the angel sang peace, peace to the men or to the people, uh, peace, when they sang peace, <laughs> That peace was not achieved until the cross, because through that sacrifice, we received forgiveness for our sins and free entrance in the presence of our God, the Father. But the cross itself, although so important for us, was not the end of it, of the story. It was actually just the first amazing chapter, because the second chapter is the resurrection. And we want to look at the power of his resurrection, the transforming power of what he has done there. You know, he had empowered us and gave us purpose through that resurrection. And it's, if you want, if you read uh, Romans chapter one, it is in the words of Paul, the ultimate proof of his deity. It says here, Jesus Christ, our Lord was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. That's Romans chapter one, the first verses. Through his resurrection, we have received power not only to live in obedience, but also to walk in the power of Christ Jesus when the Spirit of God that raised him from the dead now dwells in us. You know, Christian, Christian life, Christian church ought to be more than just customs and people grouping together in a social environment and having a nice family life. Church ought to be filled with God's supernatural power which is possible for us today through that power of the resurrection, through the Spirit of God that dwells in us. Two years ago, we prayed that God's glory will be, will be revealed in the midst of this church, that we will be a haven for people who need healing, 
That will be a lighthouse for this neighborhood and for this city, for those who need Christ to come and receive him. And that's possible in our midst through the power of the resurrection. We have received peace from God, peace with God through the cross and receive power to obey and to live a life worthy of the calling through his resurrection. Even more, as we look back to our past and we think of our sins and it's everything that was bad that we did in our lives, this comes again, through, through resurrection comes the power to justify. Again, in the book of Romans, in chapter 4, it says that he, Christ, was delivered up for our trespasses and he was raised for our justification. Through his being risen from the dead, we can receive justification. We can be made right with God. Or this word, justification, again, if, you, if it's too fancy, it means this. You are counted as righteous. Counted as righteous. God sees you and says, you are righteous. That is justification through Christ Jesus, through our, through his being raised, through him being raised from the dead. Even more, he has power to give life. John 14, the whole chapter is amazing, but this phrase is in John 14, I am the resurrection and the life. There's something amazing that happens on that first day of the week when he rose from the dead. He was the first fruit, but through him, through his resurrection, we are the next fruit. We are part of the same kingdom of God being raised from the dead in our life inside. Having received an inheritance that is unperishable with Christ Jesus, guarded by him for us forever. And our future is bright. Even though the present may be eh, sometimes not so pleasant, our future is amazing. And even today, through all the hardships, through all the challenges, we have hope and joy because of Christ Jesus, because of his spirit. God's kingdom is not just food, and not just what we drink or eat or dress with. It's peace, joy. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I have to sing the song to actually remember that phrase. Anyway, so this is the power of the cross. Peace with God through his sacrifice. This is the power of the resurrection. An amazing life now and forever because of Christ Jesus. Being justified, being empowered, being challenged, being commissioned after his resurrection. But there is something more. There's something more here. And I want to listen to these words. Actually, again, we go back to John. John 21, this. Listen to these words, John 21, 12. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Not the most profound, if you want, theological theological statement. It's not like one of the prayers of, of Paul in Colossians or Ephesians or, or Philippians, where you hear all these amazing uh, words and these majestic declarations. It's a simple call. Come and have breakfast. But let's put it in the context. Have you ever wondered what was it in the hearts and minds of the, of the disciples when they saw Jesus after the resurrection? Not only the joy inexpressible, but also the guilt. Also the shame of having run away. I mean, they did run away, scattered and scared. And one of them even denied him with curses. And now the Lord meets them on the beach. And his words are, come and have breakfast. No rebuke, no finger pointing, just food, just breakfast. He knew them. He knew their hearts and he understood them. He had empathy for them. He's about to commission them to change the world to the power of the gospel. But for now, they just sit down and eat together. And what I long for since Mark 1 was to get to this one specific verse, Mark 16, 7. Again, not the most majestic verse, but it has something so sweet to my heart. It says this, But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. These words are a testimony to the power of God's grace. Tell his disciples and Peter. Why is Peter singled out? 
Imagine the one who boasted, Lord, even if everybody denies you, I will never deny you. And before all of them gathered before Christ at the Last Supper, Christ says, you will, Peter, just wait, you will. And he said, no, I will never. And the night goes on and he actually denies Christ and denies him with curses even. So imagine him, not just his own shame and guilt, but being having the disciples, the other guys just watching him, looking at him, says, you're the one that said, I won't. And you did even more than we did. You, you did it with curses. And so, you, you know, it was hard for Peter. And now these words from Jesus himself, tell his disciples and Peter. He singled out because Peter needed to hear this message loud and clear. Grace is for those who don't deserve it. I say it again. Grace is for those who don't deserve it. Peter hears these words and he hears also, you denied him. You ran away. But that is not the end of it. God knows you. God knows your name and God still wants to meet you and have breakfast with you. And then even commission you with the task of changing the world. The power of God's the power of the cross of Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the power of his grace. These are the three things I want us to focus in 2020, 2021, sorry. Because 2020 has been a difficult year for all of us, even for the introverts, you know. I mean, for us introverts, imagine having all our family close by all day long. It has not been easy. But one thing that did not change this year is our Lord and Savior. He is still the same. His cross still has power to free us from our sins, to just justify us, and to give us hope. And His grace has still is still there for us, even if we do not deserve it, or even especially because we don't deserve it. So one of my prayers this year for all of us is that we will experience more of this verse. You know, read with me for please, Philippians three ten. Philippians 3.10, 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. This is my prayer for all of us, to know God's power in the cross, God's power in the res resurrection, and God's power in his grace, that our lives would reflect the glorious Lord and King that reigns over us that we can witness his power at work in us and through us. The Lord is risen. By his death, we are at peace with God. By his resurrection, we're justified and empowered. And in his grace, we have received healing and even commissioning for a mission for his, God, for his glory. May we all experience this year the power of God's grace. Maybe all that hear these words, tell them an Adi too. Tell them and just input your name over there. Imagine God knowing your problems, you know, knowing your name, knowing your heart, knowing your sins, knowing your struggles, knowing your victories. And he still loves me and still wants to use me to change the world. You may see yourself as imperfect, ill-equipped, faulty, scarred, marred, whatever words you want to use. But God says, come and have breakfast. I will empower you. I will transform you. I will change you. And through you, I will change the world. I pray that we can hear these words, come and, come and have breakfast. As an invitation to all of us who are weary and burdened and scared and scarred, all of us who need his grace this year. I, I, I don't think I'm the only one who needs God's grace now more than ever. Because this grace will transform us and we can be, truly be, world-changing Christians. Not because we are special, but because of his power. The power of the cross, the power of his resurrection, and the power of his grace. So my last words... and. Pretty fast today, so no rabbit trails. I'm actually stuck with my notes. If you feel weak, unprepared, tired, or overwhelmed, 
in anything that you may do in your life. For example, as a parent, if you know that you are in over your head, the message is this, my grace is sufficient for you. If you're a spouse and you feel burdened with, with past mistakes and look at scars or even open wounds in your relationship with your spouse, saying it again, his grace is sufficient for you. If you're a young man or woman and you feel the pressure to conform from all over around you, from school, teachers, friends, social media, again, I say, his grace is sufficient for you. Maybe you all remember these words from the Lord himself as we stare 2021 in the face. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I pray for our church. I'll pray even right now that we, through this year, can enjoy God's presence in our life. Can we enjoy the peace we have received with the Father through, his, through, Christ, through the cross of Christ. Now we can enjoy the justification and transformation that comes through the resurrection of Christ as the Spirit who raised Him from the dead dwells within us. But more, even more, now we can experience God's grace. That even though we feel inadequate and still marred by the sins of today or of yesterday, that we understand that He knows our names. He knows our past failures and even present, present failures. And he still says, come, have breakfast with me. I will change your life. My grace is for you. My grace is sufficient for you, even though, or especially because you don't deserve it. Guys, our church, although small in the eyes of the world, is an essential part of God's kingdom. And we are essential to this world. They may call us non-essential right now and, and close the doors and keep us closed and stuff, but we are essential because the only way to receive Christ the Lord is by hearing the gospel. The only way that the world will change around us is through the gospel of Christ, and we are its messengers. And like Paul says, we are ambassadors, and we are imploring the world to speak these words, make peace with God. May 2021 be a year when you are transformed and you receive the healing that you need, the transformation that you, you hope and pray for so that you can go and fulfill the mission God gave you and God gave me and God gave, God gave all of us to change this world with his gospel. Transformed by his grace, empowered and emboldened, I pray that we look this year in the face and we say, this year will be different. We will shine for the Lord because his grace is sufficient for us. Amen. Let's pray.